weeks that follow. We endure such torturous training that I can't believe that this is something I had wanted to be a part of for so long. Our reveille comes most mornings at five o'clock, when we're expected to jump from our beds and dress and line up in formation outside the barracks, ready for a four-hour hike. I form good relations with most of the men, but it's to Will that I cleave most mornings, and he appears content to spend his time with me too. I haven't experienced much friendship in my life. The only one who ever mattered to me was Peter, but he abandoned me twice. First for Sylvia, and then, after the incident at school, my subsequent disgrace ensured that I would never lay eyes on him again. Perhaps it's not unusual then that I find myself seething with jealousy on an early morning march, when I find that Will is walking ahead with none other than Wolf, our conscientious objector. I stare at them in surprise, for no one ever walks or talks with Wolf, on whose bed small white feathers appear every night. I fall into line next to them. Tristan, Will says cheerfully. Arthur was just telling me about his plans for the future. Oh yes, I ask, looking at Wolf. Planning on making a run for the papacy, are you? Steady on, Tristan, says Will. You know the part as a vicar. Nothing wrong with the church. No, no, of course not. I say, having momentarily forgotten the sainted Reverend Bancroft. Not the priesthood, no," says Wolf, enjoying my discomfort. I thought politics. Politics, why not? Well, if a fellow were to stand for Parliament in my constituency and he refused to fight, but Arthur isn't refusing to fight," says Will. He's here, isn't he? I'm here training," insists Wolf. I've told you, Will. When we're shipped out, I'll refuse to fight. The military tribunal was supposed to make a decision on my case weeks ago. What exactly are you objecting to? I ask. You don't like war, is that it? Nobody should like war, Sadler, and I can't imagine that anyone really does, except for Sergeant Clayton, perhaps. No, I simply don't believe that it is right to take another man's life in cold blood. But my dear fellow, says Will, then it will be the stretcher bearer's job for you. Well, if it's the only alternative, small use to politics you'll be if you're picked off by a sniper, I say, and Will turns on me then, frowning, and I feel ashamed. I look away, unable to bear my friend's approbation. Something the matter, Sadler asks Wolf as Will advances forward. No, we were just talking, he says casually. I'm not trying to steal him away from you. I stare at him, unable to find words to express my indignation, and he bursts out laughing as he marches away. The day that our uniforms arrive, Will and I have been rostered for guard duty. Every man in the troop has been given new boots, two thick grey shirts, a pair of khaki trousers, and a heavy overcoat. It's in this fine new set of clothing that Will and I stand guard. What about poor old Wolf then, Tristan? Did you ever see anything so disgusting? Earlier in the day, when Wells and Moody were distributing the uniforms, Wolf found himself with a shirt that was too large and trousers that were too tight. He looked like a clown, and the entire troop, save Will, was reduced to tears of laughter. I only stopped myself from joining in the hysteria through my desire not to have Will think badly of me. He brings it on himself, I say. Why do you always take his side? Well, the man actually talks a lot of sense. Will replies quietly, and damn it all, he has a right to his opinion. I just, I don't like the way he's treated. That's all. But let's not talk about it any more. Hey, guess what today is? I think about it. Your birthday? <laughs> Lucky guess. How old are you then? You know full well, Tristan. I'm only a few months older than you. Nineteen. Nineteen years old and never been kissed. I say without really thinking about the words, and ignoring the fact that he is not, in fact, a few months older than me, but nearly a year and a half. Steady on, old man," he says quickly. "I've been kissed, all right. Why, haven't you? Well, of course," I say. Sylvia Carter had kissed me after all, and there had been one other, both utter disasters. 
Now, if I was at home, Will says then, I expect my parents will be throwing a party for me and inviting the neighbours. And Eleanor, of course. Who's Eleanor? Eleanor's my fiance. I've told you about her, haven't I? I stare at him. I know full well that he has never mentioned her, and can see from the expression on his face that he knows the same thing. Your fiance? Well, in a manner of speaking, we've been sweethearts for ever so long. She's a terrific girl and not at all conventional. I can't stand conventional girls. Can you, Tristan? No, I say. Digging the toe of my boot into the dirt, imagining for a moment that the soil is Eleanor's head. I'm not entirely sure I know what he means when he says that she is not conventional, but then I remember him telling me that he has been told that he snores something terrible, and the phrase attacks me like a viper as I realize exactly what it is he's saying. Don't you have a sweetheart at home then, Tristan? You know I don't. <laughs> What's the matter? You're not jealous, are you? He says, laughing at the absurdity of it. Of course I'm not jealous. I want to say more, but I know that I can't. I was just hurt that you didn't tell me about her. That's all. I say eventually. I don't like secrets. But it wasn't a secret, he says quietly. He steps closer, then puts a hand out and touches me gently on the arm. He looks up at me, his face caught in a mixture of confusion and sadness. He opens his mouth to say something, but then he changes his mind and turns away, shaking his arm as if he wants to rattle it loose. For Christ's sake, Tristan, he hisses and walks away from me into the darkness. My nine weeks at Aldershot are almost at an end, and I wake up in the middle of the night for the first time since my arrival. In another thirty-six hours we are due to pass out, but it's not anxiety about what lies ahead that breaks my sleep. It's the sound of a muffled commotion coming from across the room, an unsettling reverberation of dragging and kicking, then silence, and I fall asleep again. At drill the following morning, as Sergeant Clayton orders us into our ranks, there is an empty place, a soldier, AWOL. Does anyone know where Wolf is? Sergeant Clayton asks. There is silence. Well, I might as well tell you that our self-proclaimed conscientious objector has disappeared. Taken himself off into the night like the coward that he is. But we'll find him. I can promise you that. I don't for a moment think that Wolf has absconded, but my mind is on other things. Will we be dispatched to France immediately? Will I live another week? These are far more pressing concerns to me than whether or not Wolf has made a bid for freedom. I am in Will's company, walking back later that afternoon towards the barracks, when Hobbs comes bounding over to us. I found Wolf. Where? asks Will. Is he all right? About four miles from here, replies Hobbs. In the forest where we went on marches. Up there? I ask in surprise. For it's an unpleasant place filled with freezing cold streams. There's no place to hide out. He wasn't hiding, Sadler. He was found there. Wolf's dead. Dead? I ask. But how? I haven't got the full story yet, replies Hobbs. But it seems he was discovered face down in a stream. His head split open. Must have been trying to run away, tripped over a rock and fell face forwards. Anyway, he's gone now, and good riddance, I say, to our resident feather man. My instincts kick in, and I grab Will's arm just as he lashes out to punch Hobbs in the face. What's the matter with you? asks Hobbs, jumping back. Don't tell me you've signed up to this rot too. Will struggles against my arm for a moment, and only when I feel his muscles relax do I release him. I watch him, though as he glares at Hobbs, pure anger in his face, before he turns and marches away. When Will hasn't returned by nightfall, I go in search of him. It's our last night together as recruits, and we've been given the evening off. Some of the men I know have gone into the nearby village to the pub, and I decide to check there first. As it happens, I don't need to go that far, for halfway there, 
I discover him by chance in one of the clearings in the woods. He's sitting in the moonlight by a stream. Will, I say, running towards him. I've been worried about you. Have you? He asks, looking up. And I can see that he's been crying. Sorry, I, I just needed to be alone for a while. It's all right, I say, sitting down beside him. He lets out a deep sigh and rubs his eyes before turning to me with a sad smile on his face. So here we are. The end of the road. Was it worth it, do you think? <laughs> we'll find out soon enough, when we get to France. France, yes, he says thoughtfully. It's all in front of us now. I believe Sergeant Clayton would be disappointed if we weren't all killed in the line of duty. Don't say that, I reply with a shudder. I'm sure he doesn't want to see any of us dead. He wanted Wolf dead, that's for sure. Wolf killed himself. Perhaps not on purpose, but only an idiot would go into the forest in the middle of the night. Oh, Tristan, you really are unbelievably innocent at times. Wolf didn't kill himself. He didn't fall, he was murdered. Killed in cold blood. For God's sake, Will, he, he deserted the camp. He'd run... He hadn't run anywhere, he said angrily. He told me only a few hours earlier that he'd been granted his status as a conscientious objector. He wasn't even being sent out there as a stretcher bearer. Turns out he was quite adept at mathematics and had agreed to help in the war department under house arrest. He was going home, Tristan. The very next morning, and then just like that, he disappears. Who else knew about this? I ask. Clayton, of course. Wells and Moody. And then I remember the noises that I heard in the night. The kicking of the blankets. The dragging along the floor. Jesus. Now you have it, Will says in an exhausted tone. But what can we do about it anyway? Nothing. A moment later, his head is buried in his hands and I realise he is weeping. What's going to happen to us out there, Tristan? I'm scared shitless, honest I am. He reaches over with both hands and pulls me to him. In my idle moments imagining such a scene, I have always assumed that I would reach for him and he would pull away, denouncing me as a degenerate and false friend. But now I am neither shocked nor surprised by his initiative. It feels perfectly natural, everything that happens between us. And for the first time since that dreadful afternoon when my father beat me to within an inch of my life, I feel that I have come home.